recording was took place at the home of Richard Forrester at 614 West Columbia Parkway, Columbia City, Indiana. It was recorded on the 28th of February, 2003. Richard Forrester served in the Air Force during the Korean War and achieved the rank of Airman First Class. Okay, Dick, uh, were you drafted or or did you uh, en enlist? Well, to start with, we were married on December 24th, 1950, and I was working for the FBI in Washington. And one of my best friends at that time was Vera Reinhardt from Pella, Iowa, and he was single. And we'd lived in a rooming house, and every, all the guys were single, but he was going to join the Marines, and I wanted to join the Marines too, but I thought since I was just married, it might not be the wisest thing to do, so I decided that I would join the Air Force, and there was a waiting list at the time, so we came back to Columbia City, and I got on the waiting list. And how it, why it happened that three of my high school uh, classmates enlisted with me on April 18, 1951. We were sent to Lackland Air Force Base, and at that time there was a lot of a lot of guys going into the Air Force, and they didn't have permanent quarters for us, and we were in tents, and we had to. Uh, live in tents and ditch around the tents and so forth. I, a drill instructor, and that wasn't what he was called, but maybe flight instructor or something. Anyway, that was that was Corporal Haney, Corporal P.J. Haney, and why I remember him, I will not know. And uh, while we were there, we got flu shots. At that time, flu shots were unheard of, but they were the government was testing flu shots, so they they gave us flu shots, and so we had one of the first we were one of the first people to get flu shots. And speaking of first of, that was the first place I'd ever had soft ice cream. They had trailers set around on the base, and in the evenings you could go and get soft ice cream with fresh strawberries on top. And I thought that was probably the best eating I'd ever eaten in my 19 years. That was really good stuff. Well, after I after I left Lack, well, Lackland, we had to take aptitude tests, and I think there was nine tests, and the high school was seven. And I got seven on all of the tests. It was either seven tests with a score of nine or nine test with a high score of seven. And so they could have put me into electronics or they could have put me into food service or military or police or anything, but they sent me to clerk type of school. Now in high school, the best I ever did on a 15 minute time test or five minute test or whatever whatever the time time was, the best I ever did was 15 words per minute with six errors. So they send me to clerk type of school. I did a little better there. I think I got up to 30 words a minute. But anyway, from there they sent me to San Marcos Air Force Base. San Marcos was in between Austin, Texas and San Antonio, Texas. It was a helicopter uh, training base and it was a base that was there solely because of Lyndon Johnson, because this was Lyndon Johnson's congressional district, and he was able to get, uh, back in the 40s, to get uh, a bit Air Force base, Air Army Air Corps base put there. And it was hot. There was a stretch of seven or eight weeks, it got above 100 every day. 
and uh, but I got there in September, I guess, or no, I got there in July, June or July. Anyway, I, I the instead of clerk typist, they assigned me to the finance office, and there we we posted to the pay records, and we made uh, we issued savings bonds and all those things, and. Uh, when I got my time and grade in, I made my first stripe. And when I got my time and grade in, I made my second stripe. When I got my time and grade in, I didn't make my third stripe because at that time, I was assigned to the commercial accounts section. And we wrote checks to pay uh, commercial businesses in town or different places. Anyway, on Saturday, we had to work every third Saturday. Well, in commercial accounts, there wasn't anything to do on Saturday morning. And our assistant finance officer was a little short, chubby, bald warrant officer who thought I should be doing something when actually there was nothing I could do on Saturday morning. So since I was moving off, I didn't get put in for promotion when I was first eligible. I had to wait a month. All, my, all the other guys that came down with me, they got promoted to airman first. Or at that time, it was buck sergeant. And uh, so I had to wait a month. Well, when it came time for, when they got enough time in grade, they immediately got promoted to staff sergeant. I would have got promoted to staff sergeant the next month then, but by then I was on my way to Korea. So I missed out. And as far as promotion goes, I never did get my fourth stripe because in Korea the career field was frozen. And then when I got back to the States, then I didn't have enough time left to serve. They didn't think it was worthwhile to promote me. But anyway, I went to Japan first. And uh, was stationed briefly at a place called uh, Itazuki. Itazuki. And uh, this was a, a base or a place, it was a naval facility, but uh, when the Japanese had it, it was a place that uh, they trained or they had uh, kamikaze pilots. And in the center, it was open in the center, a courtyard, and in the middle of the courtyard was a fountain. And that was part of their ritual, uh, either in their training or when they sent them off uh, to fly the planes. From there, I was sent to uh, 5th Air Force headquarters in Tegu, maybe it was Seoul. Anyway, I was sent to Korea, and then Korea, they sent me back to Japan because the 58th Fighter Bomber Wing had a maintenance base in Iwakuni, Japan. They had about 3,500 people there, and I was assigned to the finance office there. It was an unusual situation because married men with Japanese units had to stay Japan for 18 months, but since I was with a Japanese or a Korean unit, I got Korean rotation points, and I would be able to go home in 12 months. And we were in the same barracks as some of these Japanese uh, uh, point uh, earners, and uh, sometimes that became kind of contentious between the two groups. And. Uh, we had one guy in our group who was a staff, young staff sergeant who worked for the adjutant general's office. And there was nothing in there. He was a young, he was the lowest ranking person in there. The rest were all master sergeants, married master sergeants. But he, at noon, when we'd be laying on the bunks, he would, he would brag about this, lie about that, tells tall stories and so I thought one noon I'll fix him. I said 
Colonel Orfield, who was our commanding officer. I said, Colonel Orfield was in the office today, and he said that we were going to be getting Japanese rotation points, which meant you'd have to stay for a full 18 months. Well, he went back to the adjutant general's office, told all those master sergeants it was going to be changed, and they were all married, and so, uh, anyway, that made them awful unhappy, and then, we, like I said, we had these 3,500 men in our, uh, attached with the 58th Fighter Bomber Wing in the maintenance shops, and this was about 1 o'clock when we went back to work. And by 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, our captain who was in charge of the finance office called me in and said, was Colonel Warfield in the office this morning? And I said, yes, because he was. That was the truthful part. He said, did he say that the, the rotation points were going to be changed to the same as Japanese? And I said, no. So in the, in the space, one o'clock in the afternoon, and this guy went back to his office. So 3.30 in the afternoon, it had traveled all through the 3,500 guys in that maintenance. It, it, all of our detachment over there had gone through all 3,500 of them in two and a half hours. And the next day I was slated, it was a day off, and I had signed up to take a joyride on a courier flight to Korea. You just go one base to another and just fly over and fly back. And I thought, oh, if this plane would just crash on this flight, then, I, then it would all be taken care of. My, my only punishment or penalty for starting this rumor was that uh, the captain said he wouldn't put me in for promotion that month. And since, since promotions were frozen, I, I had no, no penalty and no punishment outside of what I inflicted on myself. But uh, then there was, there was such a rumor to that in fact it kept up. There was an opening for, in our finance office in Korea, so I volunteered for that, so I'd be assured of not spending more than 12 months. So then I went to Korea, and it was uh, the K-2 Air Force Base, which is, was a Taegu in Korea. And uh, I spent the summer and, and fall at Taegu. Uh, it was a fighter bomber base. It was the uh, F-84 Thunder Jets. And uh, the base had never come under, under communist control, but they did get as close as the end of the runway. And the planes would just take off. And as soon as they'd get in the air, they'd drop their bombs. So uh, I guess it's the second or third largest city in Korea now, and I guess it's a thoroughly modern city, but then it was just dusty and dirty. And I think my, my, my first time when I was in Korea to get, re to get a sign, I was in town, and here was in early December, and smell, I never smelled anything so bad in all my life. It opened sewers, and even in December, it smelled bad. And oh, it was cold. We we spent that spent a night or two over there in a tent. And some guy some guy was kind. He said, "Show me how to fold blankets." So you had as many layers underneath you as you had above you because those canvas cots would just let the cold come up through the bottom. So you needed to have something underneath. And he showed me how to fold the bank blankets. Anyway. I had every item of clothes on that I had. I had long underwear, I had my fatigues on, I had my field jacket on, I had my cap and my sock cap and my gloves on. I had every, all the clothes I could put on and I darn near froze those things. But anyway, then when I got sent, I got sent back and I, I worked in finance and uh, we, uh, we, paid the troops, and they weren't the, uh, the flyers, the pilots, and, and all the troops. Uh, in between our, our building, the next building, building next to us was the photo lab, and we had 
the horseshoe pits there. And we we spent a lot of time uh, uh, pitching horseshoe. And the uh, the guys from the Polar Lab always had a big had a big kick out of watching the gun film and you know, the film from the gun cameras because on their way back the pilots uh, they'd they'd either if they hadn't dropped their bombs yet they'd drop them and then they'd shoot up their ammunition and uh, they always laughed about how they could see these through the film see these guys diving down trying to shoot cows and they never they never came they never came close to them so I don't know how how many of the enemy they got with their guns but they didn't get many cows well then I uh, but then the, uh, the peace tr uh, truce had been signed and so forth and I came back then in the late fall and uh, was assigned to Eglin Air Force Base the finance office down there Eglin was uh, about 50 miles east of Pensacola and uh, it was a base mainly for testing, engineering, uh, uh, so forth and it, it's the largest Air Force base in, in the country and they had nine different fields down there and uh, one field was used for Jimmy Doolittle's, Doolittle's uh, Tokyo bombers, they trained down there and uh, it was uh, also they had an area where they had uh, demonstrations for congressmen and people where they showed firepower demonstrations. They dropped bombs and napalm. And they would have a B-36. As soon as it came in sight, it would start dropping bombs, and it dropped bombs until it got out of sight. I never did get rid of one of those, but. Uh, while we were there, we had a, we had a baby that was stillborn, and the baby was buried in the Pensacola Naval Air Station, or the National Cemetery in Pensacola, and uh, had a chance to get out early to go to school, and I, so I got uh, I got admitted to Purdue University, and I got discharged early enough in January to make the first sem second semester. And on the way home, we uh, we crossed the Ohio River uh, at Louisville, and uh, going up State Road Three, a guy would uh, some, a soldier from Fort Knox was going back to Fort Knox. And he pulled out past a, a beer truck or an ice cream truck and hit us head on. So. We uh, we were laid up in the hospital in Clarksville for a while, and naturally I missed the uh, missed that semester. And uh, about May, I thought, well, I've got to do something. I, I've got to get a job, and uh, so I got a job. Travel this abstract in Fort Wayne. I liked the work so well. It was, uh, it was I, I was I was good at it, and so I never did go to college. And I guess that's uh, oh wow! I'm gonna add one thing. Eight years later, after we had two boys, and well, we had our third boy, we went down to the National Cemetery at uh, in Pensacola Naval Air Station, and I happened to. I thought, well, I want to go over to Eglin and see what Eglin is like. So we drove over to Eglin, and I knew a guy from high school, Benny Coy, was stationed at Eglin. So I went to base locator, and I said, well, I want to see Benny Coy. And they said, well, he's over on the SAC area. I've never heard of the SAC area. So anyway, they told me where it was, and so I went over there drive up, had a little blue Corvair, a wife and two little boys and a baby boy, and the guy at the guard, the guy at the guard check waved us on. So I pull into a parking lot, there's a hangar, and I go say, well, I'm looking for Benny Coy. And they said, well, Benny's over in that other hangar. 
So I get in the car and I back out and I go over to the other hangar, park in the parking lot, go into the hangar, looking for Benny Coy. Well, it's his day off. He's over at Defuniac Springs fishing. And about that time, uh, the guy grabbed me and he says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm looking for Benny Coy. He said, well, you're not supposed to be here. So he said, I'll go get somebody else. So you stay here. So he went and got a tech sergeant. And he said, oh, you're not supposed to be here. We've got to call the air police. So they said, come out here, on the, out here in the grass and lay down. So they, they spread eagle me out on the grass and they called it, and the air police came. And they came up in an international uh, crew cab pickup truck. They loaded me in the back of that pickup truck. Two air police with shotguns sat back there and guarded me. And we went into headquarters and they alerted uh, off at off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, SAC headquarters, and unauthorized personnel was on in the SAC area. And we stayed there, oh I know, we stayed there quite a while because they had to call uh, CID investigators from Pensacola Naval Air Station to come and interview me. So they drug me out to the, took me out to the gatehouse. There they interviewed me. They said, what are you doing here? And I said, no, oh, look for Benny Coy. That rascal, if he'd only been there, he'd save me a lot of trouble if he had not fishing that day. But anyway, I uh, uh, looked for Benny Coy. And they said, where are you from? And where do you work? And so they called my employer. They asked him where. They asked him where we were, where I was, what I looked like. Uh, they said, what, what did you see here? Well, I'd seen in one hangar a bunch of dollies with some tubes on, probably four foot long, maybe a foot in diameter, setting on these dollies. And I also could look out on the flight line and see B-47 bombers out there that had things on the wings that looked like these canisters could fit in. And I had just read a month or so before in Popper Mechanics about home dog missiles, air-to-ground missiles. So I assume those were home dog missiles or, or something to carry atomic bomb. And I was smart enough to tell him I didn't see nothing. And I was smart enough not to say, well, I think I saw some home dog missiles. But anyway, I didn't say anything. And uh, maybe they asked me, anyway, I didn't make one mistake. I said, no, I didn't see anything except what I would see down at Bunker Hill Air Force Base. I said, what were you doing at Bunker Hill Air Force Base? I guess they thought I was uh, was a, a traveling terrorist or saboteur or something. And I said, well, just Armed Forces Day. I just went in to see. But anyway, that was that was my last uh, last uh, contact with the Air Force. Okay, that that's that's uh, that, that's amazing. Uh, after. Uh, after you returned to Indiana, uh, when did you start with the post office? Well, I didn't, I, I, I went after the accident, after I got so I off the crutches, I went to the abstract office and I worked there for quite a while. And uh, then uh, uh, ended up, uh, ended up with the post office in 1973. Have you uh, attended any reunions or had uh, any, met any of your old friends from the service since? Only one from Roanoke, Virginia. He, one day here we got a call and they said, this is Ray. Yeah, so Ray and 
His wife is Mary Jane, and they stopped in. They come from Norfolk, Virginia. That's the first time I'd seen him. I went through tech school with him. And, uh, we were stationed at San Marcos in the finance office together. But that's the only person I've ever, ever run across. I did meet some people from Columbia, guys from Columbia City. I met one that I visited with. I met in Korea. That's all over there, but uh, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Dick.